So you want to know about Cyrus? <gasps> My baby. from Chicago to Minneapolis to do a Crypticon convention for the Thursday. And uh, I drove past this old farmhouse. It's, it's about an eight, nine hour drive from Chicago. And had been doing some research on serial killers and things just kind of triggered in my mind. Well, there was a, a deer that had been hit right on the side of the road so all of a sudden things started to come together and I was like, it'd be really creepy if all the stuff I had been researching actually happened in that house. And it looked like it could. Um, and then basically I had gotten there, it was kind of tired of writing scripts, so I wanted to do some narrative uh, fiction. Uh, kicked out the short story and then eventually the short story became a script. So, yeah, I play Cyrus in Cyrus, if Cyrus remains the name of the movie. <laughs> um, um, Cyrus is a man who's... <sighs> grew up as a uh, affected young man. You know why you don't have a daddy? Because <laughs> daddy couldn't love you. Went through a hard life through parents and family and... A lot of bad things happened in his life that affected him emotionally. And, and these days, this child would have been in foster care or, or possibly a ton of psychotherapy. And, and uh, Cyrus never had that opportunity. My, my character never had that opportunity. And he's very much became a loner and afraid of his own voice and afraid to talk to people or have emotional contact. Emotional contact for this man became physical contact. He works in a, a place in his mind that's not, it's not somewhere where I think any of us want to go. I know that we had gotten the script out to quite a few agents, and there were obviously certain actors that I really wanted, and, and we kind of got lucky. Um, you know, I, I wanted Lance, I wanted Brian. We got the script to them, and they both actually really liked the roles. Mark uh, called me and said he had this script and I got it and I read it and I had to read it like three or four times because it's a very wonderfully uh, uh, kind of I can't I don't want to say complicated but it but it has a, a, a very wonderful narrative that you have to really pay attention to so I had to read it three or four times and then I said to myself I really want to do this because it's like a challenge a real challenge it really was and it is I'm not done yet. And so, you know, it was good. And I spoke to Mark a few times on the phone and, and, and tried to get a feel of what he was like. And he ends up being uh, sort of my kind of guy. You know, we brought Danielle and then uh, Tony. I, I had known I wanted him as the cameraman, Tony Alda. Well, I think when I got the script, I thought, oh, is it another horror movie? Because I don't not really, I don't know, what is it? Because I read so many. and. And I got it and just jammed through it. And you know, about 40 minutes took me to read through it. I couldn't stop reading it. And I thought, wow, this is a great character piece. This is really interesting. I could hear all the characters' voices. I could see everything as it was happening. And it was just a page turner. And I thought, I really want to be involved in something like this. His writing is poetic. I mean, it really is lovely. And it's seeing stuff, it's shot beautifully. And if you look outside now, it's this beautiful winter wonderland amidst all of this 
horrible chaos that happened. So I totally wanted to be attached immediately. And then knowing that Lance was involved and Tony was involved and I was ready to sign up. As far as the girls, um, that we had some pretty big casting calls for. I think, I want to say we actually had nine to 10,000 um, headshots sent in uh, for the, the three principal girls. Um, Eris came into an audition that we actually held in Chicago, and she was just a great actress right off the bat. Um, Shauna, I was familiar with her work and wanted her, and then uh, Anne, who plays Vicky, actually had submitted a, a tape, and she had worked on another movie with Tony. And so that's how we were introduced. When I first read uh, the script, that's, uh, Vicky stood out immediately. I really liked, um, I'm very attracted to strong female characters. And um, I had a wonderful time with Vicky. She's very, uh, from the outside, you get an impression of her. And uh, I think as through, through the story and how it travels, you start to see this very, um, uh, complex woman. And what was really interesting, as much as she gets tortured and tormented and you think it's a character that's just, you know, uh, unfortunately getting, you know, beaten to death, he really, Cyrus really takes every, you know, we all have our vices, we all have things that we use, and the things that this character um, uses, uh, as, as, as her strengths, you know, what she uses to get what she wants and how she, she manipulates. Cyrus takes away each one of those from her. So it was a real interesting um, breakdown of, of, of this character that I saw. So it's starting to unravel. Yeah, so, well, the, the, the real beginning of yeah. it, in the screenplays that he calls the state troop, right. and, and so he kills the cop. Right, right. Um, um, and that, that was it. I think the thing that I like best about the potential for horror movies is that you can really kind of explore, you know, the shadow aspects of human beings or their darker side. And you, you can brush up against that in drama, uh, but you have a lot more liberty uh, when you're shoot, shooting in the horror genre. I try to bring in a lot of the, the archetypal imagery um, in the horror movies. So, I mean, in Cyrus, you, you know, you have the evil mother archetype. Uh, it, it, to an extent, you might even be touching on, like, an anti-hero journey. You know, I, I used to love to read Campbell a lot as well. Um, and those were kind of some of the elements that I was bringing in. I mean, in regard to Cyrus's journey, I didn't really want to create a, a, a cookie-cutter killer. Um, that the audience just instantly hated or was afraid of. I hopefully uh, brought in elements uh, from the psychological background that at times the audience will empathize with the character. I'm going into town. Do you want anything from the store? No. Good. So we can't afford it. And that will also hopefully create a little bit of confusion in their mind. I mean, I think we're, we're trained to either like someone or hate someone and not necessarily ping pong back and forth. Hi, my name is Tony Alda. I play Tom in the movie Cyrus. I actually just wrapped a couple hours ago. It is now 5.25. We wrapped at 3.25 uh, Eastern Time. I am a little slightly delirious and tired, so if I start just saying random shit, please excuse me and play along. Um, Tom is the cameraman to, to Danielle's character, uh, Maria, and uh, I basically am documenting her, her interview with Emmett, and through the interview we begin to have flashbacks t throughout the entire movie to um, Vicky, Chloe, and Tina's um, dramatic death, and we also get insight into Cyrus's mind and what made him who he is, and we just see their lives unfold and how he is a serial killer and why he is a serial killer. And um, I'm kind of like the voyeur. I am like a little omnipresent kind of, you know, thing in the background, just overseeing it all. 
and it's kind of nagging to like get away from it and just let it be, but no one listens to me. I'm kind of like the audience member who's just like, bitch, don't go that way. You're about to get stabbed in the back. And, you know, but a girl will still take off her top and go running in the woods for some odd reason at like midnight. Yeah. So I'm the voice of reason. <laughs> Oh, so I'm already dead. So, so, no, you're, you're still getting there. Okay. So, you'll go up on your toes like you, you did the final sink, right? And then, blood coming out of your mouth. Okay. And then, on your cue, you fall out of frame. Okay. And then, Brian, you just come back with that. Well, let's see. Uh, as far as, like, the some of the prosthetic pieces, like, one, one of the... The nastier bits is probably Vicky's back piece. And that the makeup artist on that was Troy. And he really just, you know, had an, a concept that we had discussed. I have no idea how to make FX. So uh, he went ahead and just started to piece it together. And, you know, you would come in and take a look at it. Uh, can you do a little bit more of this, a little less of this? And, uh, and that's it. And why the fuck am I chained? God. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Cat, uh, uh, for example, sculpted uh, who we affectionately called Baby Walter, uh, which was the the mummified baby that uh, Cyrus, you know, keeps. And she just uh, did a ton of research. You know, she brought in pictures of various. Uh, People mummified at different stages, uh, different types of skin diseases, uh, pictures of, of dead children, and literally handcrafted baby Walter. Um, and really, you, you, you kind of give them a rough idea, at, um, unless you're an artist and can sketch it out. You know, you tell them sort of the direction that you want to go. And again, if you're working with people who share your vision, uh, then they take that and run and, and do their part of it. to create um, <laughs> a portrait of the serial killer, you know. Uh, and when I was doing my research, most of the various serial killers, you had either their adult life very well documented, um, tidbits about their childhood, various stages of, of development. But you really, or I couldn't at least find one that you had a complete arc of development. So for me, that reality was best created by taking documented segments from the various killers' lives and piecing them together in a congruous through line. Um, so that's really why I did that. Compared to everything else that I played, uh, compared to the opportunities that I've had, Jen and I always play such a nice guy, the caregiver, the taker, the fixer. <laughs> I'm the destroyer. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of different things I thought about. Um, I took it to my own personal emotion dealing with, you know, my own life and people around me and read a lot, uh, internet, uh, Googled forever about serial killers around the world and uh, what these people are and how, you know, reading some of the interviews in, them in prison and uh, in courtroom interviews and, and video footage. Uh, there seems to be a through line with all these people, and, and they're really not that far off and different than, than us, and we all may know one. And that's the scary thing about someone who's serial, is that we all might know one. And uh, 
So what makes the difference between someone who's snapped and someone who hasn't? Um, I think it comes down to parenting. <laughs> there are all kinds of little um, theater things that you know I use with the actors when I'm working with them, but it really varies from actor to actor. Um, for example, Lance uh, had a really great concept of who Emmett was uh, from reading the story and the script. And he's a, he's a Meisner actor, which is uh, a system that I know enough about to be dangerous, but not enough to really have a commonality because my background is Stanislavski. Uh, you know, but he and Danielle in the end sequence actually just played a repetition game back and forth. So we let them have a theater game on set to kind of get into the, the moment. It's you. Now that ain't true at all. I spoke to him today while you and your cameraman were setting out. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure you did. What with that state boy dying? We figured it'd be best for Cyrus to pull up stakes and move. He only moved about six hours away from here. About the same amount of time I've been talking to you. Well, if you're not him, then how do you know about everything? So, in the script, I play a guy named Emmett, and he's a sort of a rural character, and he's a, a, a an enabler. And then what enablers do is a strategy. It's a strategy for their own safety, and it's a strategy of control over another person. And in this, I don't feel like I'm a bad guy. I'm just a guy that uh, is involved uh, enabling this real bad guy. And it's usually all about that control and stuff. And so I, I'm really having a phenomenal time. It's a great script, well written, a lot of good actors in it. And uh, get to try a lot of things. Uh, Brian, you know, had actually also just researched the hell out of serial killers uh, before he got to set. Um, and he and I had talked quite a bit about character development. And one of the things that was pretty helpful for me when I was writing the script was, was certain songs. Uh, and uh, Brian would actually listen to the one song uh, prior to a lot of the scenes to kind of get into that mood. Everyone's so good. It's really kind of easy to get sucked up into it when everyone else is freaking out. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's kind of hard to be the only one that's like sitting there all calm when everyone around you is screaming because they're dying. And it's funny, Mark made a good point. This is the most I've ever seen actors use iPods in a set in my entire life. That's... Is that the new thing? Because it works. I mean, like, it was so, it's so easy to get caught up in, like, like when you're there and you're, like, just kind of ready to go and, and then like it's like, nah, wait, and then that, and then this, and then everyone's talking, and there's all, and it's so easy just to start listening mm -hmm. that it's real great just to put those in, and all of a sudden it's like you just get to be ready. So, I mean, best freaking idea in the entire world. Uh, I was actually relying uh, real heavily on old Delta blues and uh, country, country rock. Uh, like the, I kind of like the juxtaposition of those two sounds and the story probably mirrors the contrast between those two genres of music. I mean I'm not listening to like you know <laughs> Bohemian Rhapsody or anything while I'm chilling in a cage on the floor <laughs> but it was it was really easy to find some stuff that you listen to and then all of a sudden you're taken to a place where you can just sit there and cry and all of a sudden someone's going action and you're going oh there we go. My uh, approach to horror, um, you know, I, I get asked once in a while, where, where does my horror fall in the scope? I, I don't really know because I don't analyze it too terribly much. I appreciate the need for gore um, in the genre. And uh, ironically, I, like, I don't, Cyrus has been called brutal by pretty much across the board everyone who's seen the thing. Um, and there's really not that much gore that you'll see on screen. I um, think it's more disturbing just because it does have those psychological elements. Um, and that's really kind of what I was going for. I, I think it's really, really difficult to scare an audience more than a boo moment. Um, so what I want to do is create longer stretches of tension 
and discomfort. And I think that's what starts to create a genuine feeling of horror. Start a 